Man, well, good morning everyone. It's good to be up here. Beautiful day outside. And we're having a prophecy conference right now down in Phoenix. And I've been part of that over the last three days. So this morning I'm bringing a little bit of the prophecy conference up to you here in Prescott Valley. So I'm preaching this morning on the subject of Ezekiel. I'm sorry, let me back up. Bible prophecy in Ezekiel. End times Bible prophecy in Ezekiel is the title of the sermon. We're going to go back to Ezekiel and get some end times Bible prophecy from that book. But first, let's start out here in Revelation chapter 20. And I want to point out a few things here. The Bible says in verse number seven, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So in this scripture, we see mention of the millennial reign of Christ, the believers living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. And during that time, the world's going to be a wonderful place to live in. There's going to be peace on earth. Lions are going to eat straw. They're not even going to attack a human being. The Bible says during that time, a little child will be able to just play with, with a snake out in the wild and not have to be worried about anything. So that's going to be a, a beautiful, perfect time on this earth. But there are going to be a lot of people at the end of that that are not satisfied with that. You know, no matter how good things are, certain wicked people, they're just never going to be happy. They're never going to be satisfied. So at the end of that thousand years of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning on this earth, there is going to be a group of people that rebel against Jesus Christ and they want to come up against him. And that's what the Bible says happens in verse seven. After that thousand years is over, the devil is released out of hell because he's been locked in hell for that thousand years, which is part of why the earth is such a great place during that time, because the devil's not deceiving anyone. But after that thousand years are expired, the devil's loosed out of his prison, and he goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. And then the Bible just throws in these three words that are a little bit random. It just says Gog and Magog. And then it says that he's going to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So all these people come and they gather against Jesus Christ and they gather against the saints and they want to overthrow this thousand year reign of Christ. And they don't even get to do battle because fire ends up raining from heaven and just destroying them all. And then we get into the great white throne, the new heaven and the new earth. Okay. With that in mind, let's go back to the book of Ezekiel. There's not a lot of detail in that story. That, that crammed a lot of events just into a couple of verses. Almost no detail, in fact, is given in Revelation 20. Go back to Ezekiel 37. It pretty much just tells us that there's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ. After that, people are going to rebel and God's going to send fire and destroy them. Really just a quick couple of verses to describe these big events. But remember those three little words that were just kind of plugged in there, Gog and Magog? Well, what that is, is a clue to you to go back to the book of Ezekiel to get more detail about that, since he only gave it a couple verses. Because there's only one other place in the whole Bible that mentions Gog and Magog, and that's back in Ezekiel chapter 38. So that's a signal to us when we're reading Revelation 20 that if we want more detail about the millennium, if we want more detail about Gog and Magog and this great battle, to go back to the book of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel is a pretty tough book to a lot of people. It's got a lot of really strong meat of the word, a lot of really deep things in it. It's a lot harder to read than the book of Revelation. But I think as you see this morning, if we look at this, we can make sense of it and it's going to be pretty clear to you by the time I'm done. Now, Ezekiel chapter 37 is that famous chapter about the dry bones. Who knows that song? Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. You heard that song before? The leg bones connected to the foot bone. All right. That comes from this chapter, actually, believe it or not. 
because Ezekiel is taken to this valley of dry bones and there are just all these bones. And I mean, these people have been dead a long time, right? He's not seeing even just bodies. I mean, he just sees very, he says these bones are very dry. Now, if you know anything about uh, bones, they have inside them bone marrow, right? So if you break open a bone, it, it's not dry on the inside. There's actually moisture there. But as a bone would get very, very old, that's all just going to completely dry out, right? So he's taken to a valley where he sees people that have been dead for a long time. And he's asked the question, son of man, can these bones live? And he says, you know, thou knowest. I don't, I don't know, right? Well, of course, they do live. They end up, the bones start connecting to one another. Imagine what that would be like to see. All these bones just start connecting, and they just start building skeletons, and then all of a sudden sinews come on them, and flesh comes on them, and they become living people once again, a great army of human beings. So, in verse 11 of chapter 37, God starts to interpret what this means. It says in verse 11, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We're cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I'll open up your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So this is pointing us to end times Bible prophecy, because there's going to be a great resurrection in the end times, right, of all those who were saved who died and their bodies were buried, their souls went to heaven, but their bodies have been laying in the earth for a very long time. Just like those dry bones were very dry. They've been dead a long time. So what's going to happen is that when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds and the trumpet sounds at the rapture, the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, a lot of times when people see that, they think to themselves, oh, that's just the New Testament saints. You know, that's just the people that were saved after the time of Christ. But there were a lot of people that were saved before the time of Christ, right? People throughout the Old Testament and the great men of the Old Testament, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they called upon the name of the Lord. They were saved. So when are they going to be resurrected? Some people have a strange belief that they've already been resurrected. But of course, that isn't true because if you remember in Acts chapter 2, when Peter's preaching, he said that David's sepulcher remains unto us until this day. David is not ascended into the heavens. You know, his body is in the grave. So if his body was still in the grave in Acts 2, guess what? It's still in the grave right now as well. But when that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first, that's when David's body is going to be resurrected. You see, even the Old Testament saints were still in Christ even though Jesus had not come because the Bible says that Christ is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, okay? So they were still in Christ. They looked forward to the cross. We look back on the cross, but they were still saved by the blood of Jesus. That's the only way anybody could ever be saved is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's the blood of Christ that saves us. So at that event of the rapture, all of the dead saints of all ages are going to be resurrected. They're going to come back to life, right? They're going to be resurrected, brought back to life. And when it comes to the nation of Israel, they are going to be placed in their own land and they're going to live in that promised land of Israel and they're going to reign with Christ there for a thousand years. You say, how do you know that? Well, Jesus told his 12 apostles, he said that in the regeneration, which is another word for the resurrection or, or coming back to life after the rapture, he said in the regeneration, the 12 apostles would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 
So that means the 12 tribes of Israel from the Old Testament are going to come up out of their graves. They're going to be caught up. They're going to be in heaven with us for a few years. And then when Christ returns at the battle of Armageddon and sets up his kingdom, the children of Israel are going to live in the promised land. They're going to live in Israel and they're going to be judged by the 12 apostles, right? One apostle will judge each tribe. Does everybody understand so far? So let's keep going here. It says in verse number 15, the word of the Lord came again unto me saying, moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel, his companions and join them one to another into one stick and they shall become one in thy hand. Now this is a miracle. Okay. And this is probably a miracle that you've never heard of because it's kind of an obscure miracle. It's not as dramatic as Jesus walking on the water, but he takes this stick and he writes Judah on one stick. And then he takes another stick and he writes Israel on it or Ephraim talking about the Northern kingdom. And he takes these two sticks in front of all Israel, right? And he basically puts these two sticks together and they just become one stick in his hand. Now that's a, that's a miracle, obviously. Now some people probably were skeptical and said, hey, this is a magic trick or whatever. But we know this was a miracle. God miraculously caused two sticks to just merge into one stick. And the thing that he was teaching is that one day the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah are going to be one nation again. Because in the Old Testament, after King Solomon, they split into two kingdoms with Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And they were separate all the time thereafter. They were totally separate. But God is saying that when they come up out of the graves in the end times, and when he brings them up out of their graves and puts them in the land, they're going to be one nation again. All 12 tribes are going to be unified into one country with the 12 apostles reigning over them. It says in verse number 20, and the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Verse 22, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel and one king shall be king to them all. They shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms at all anymore at all. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with their any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them and they all shall have one shepherd and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Now, this is pretty clear when it says that David is going to rule over them and there's going to be one shepherd. We're talking about Jesus because Jesus is the son of David. Jesus will sit on the throne of David. He's the good shepherd of Psalm 23. He's that one shepherd that's going to rule over them. And the Bible says that the Israelites are going to walk in his judgments. They're going to observe his statutes and do them. Verse 25, they shall dwell in the land that I've given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. I'll make a covenant of peace with them, etc. And then he says in verse 27, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Meaning he's saying, I'm physically even going to be there with them. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and he will be their God and they shall be his people. Now, here's what's funny about this. As we just open our Bibles and we just go through it verse by verse this morning, it makes perfect sense to us. I mean, it's just, it's just pretty easy to understand this chapter. Dead bodies come out of the graves. They go dwell in the land. Jesus Christ rules over them. It's pretty easy to compare this with Revelation and compare this with what Jesus taught in the four Gospels and to see that in the millennial reign of Christ, Jesus is going to reign over Israel and he's going to have the 12 apostles judging the 12 tribes and it's going to be great. There's going to be no idolatry, none of the perversions that they got mixed up in, in the Old Testament. But what's funny is that what, what I just explained to you, what I just taught you, this is not what 
the typical teaching of Ezekiel 37. You know, those that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, those that are into Zionism and John Hagee and, and the TV preachers and the, pretty much the whole Bible prophecy section at the Christian bookstore, what they're going to teach is that this is all about 1948 when, when Israel went back to the land, you know, and they got their country in 1948. Here's what doesn't make sense about that, okay? Did they come out of the graves in 1948? Did they come? Well, you say, well, it's just figurative. Okay, well, then let me ask you this. Did Jesus start ruling over them in 1948? Did they have David as their king? I mean, is, is uh, Benjamin Netanyahu today, is he David? You know, have any of these prime ministers or presidents that they've had over there in that nation of Israel been anything like David? Do they believe in Jesus? Do they have that one shepherd? Are they following the judgments of God? Are they following the laws of God? No, in fact, the current nation of Israel does not have Christ reigning, does not have anyone, anything like David reigning, and they're not following the judgments of God. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. They don't even follow their Old Testament. And in fact, Tel Aviv is one of the most wicked cities in the world. It's known for perversion and wickedness. It's known for debauchery. It's known as a party city for sodomites to go to to party there. It's a very wicked place. So it's pretty silly to say, oh yeah, you know, that's, that's 1948, you know, when the Israel became one nation. Wrong. What this is clearly talking about is in the millennium. You got to wait a little longer, folks. Sorry, it's not happening today. Now, the reason that's important is because when we come out of chapter 37, we go right into the subject of Gog and Magog, right? Because when we get into chapter 38, and the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So, according to what we saw in Revelation, what was the timeline of events? In Revelation, we had the thousand year reign of Christ. Then we had the battle of Gog and Magog. Then we had the great white throne and the new heaven and the new earth. Well, in Ezekiel, we have the exact same timeline, right? Because Ezekiel 37 is clearly about the millennium. If we actually follow what it says about Jesus reigning over them, it goes straight from the millennium into Gog and Magog. Perfect, right? But if we're going to put our, our pre-trib glasses on or our Zionist glasses, or if we're going to go down to the Christian bookstore and see what the TV preachers and the televangelists have to say about this passage, here's what they're going to say. Oh, well, Gog and Magog, you know, actually that takes place even before the rapture, even before the tribulation. And in fact, they'll look at current events right now in 2017 and they'll say, you know, Gog is Germany or Magog is Russia. And that, you know, they'll try to match it up with current events. They literally think that this battle of Gog and Magog is about to happen, that we're lining up for it right now. In fact, the, the movie Left Behind, which is a pretty popular movie put out by Kirk Cameron and them a while back, and then it was, and then it was remade into a, a Hollywood-style movie with, um, what's that guy's name? Nicolas Cage. You know, they gave it a full Hollywood treatment. If you go back to that original Left Behind movie with Kirk Cameron, you know what the movie starts with while the credits are still rolling? Gog and Magog. Just the battle of God. Now, is that what the Bible said? The Bible said that's after the thousand year reign of Christ. But in Left Behind, Gog and Magog is the first order of business. Why? Because if you're going to make chapter 37 be about 1948, well, then all of a sudden you got to move everything up. You know, we got to move everything up and okay, this is Gog and Magog now. And it makes zero sense. All right. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit about the battle of Gog and Magog from Ezekiel 38. And, and then you be the judge, whether this is something that's about to happen right now or whether this is something that, like Revelation said, is going to happen after the millennium. Look what it says in verse 3. And say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I'll turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters with all his bands and many people with thee. 
Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself and all thy company that are assembled unto thee and be thou a guard unto them. Now, first of all, when we see this list of nations that are being assembled here, this ties in with Revelation 20 when he said he's going to go out into the four quarters of the earth and gather all nations, right? He's going to gather these nations against. Let me just read it. I, I don't want to quote it wrong. I'm just going to quickly turn there in uh, Revelation 20 to get the exact wording. I don't want to butcher it here. It says that he will go out of the four quarters of the earth got to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the battle. So it says he's going into the four quarters of the earth. He's going all over the earth and gathering these nations to the battle. Now that makes sense because if you look at these nations in Ezekiel 38, I mean, it's Persia, it's Ethiopia, it's Libya, it's Gomer, it's Tagarma. It's a lot of different places, okay? That makes sense. It fits, right? But what if we were to apply this today? Do you think Ethiopia is about ready to make some kind of an attack on Israel right now? I mean, think about how dumb that is, right? I mean, is Ethiopia some kind of a, a, a military power right now? It makes no sense. I don't see any country uh, down around Ethiopia, you know, Ethiopia, like uh, African type people, black people from Ethiopia down there. I don't see them waging an attack on Israel anytime soon, right? But that's what these prophecy teachers, oh, this Gog and Magog is all setting up right now. Well, you know, is Ethiopia arming itself for this? You know, is Libya prepared? It doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense if it's after the millennium that just all different diversity of, of people are going to be rebelling against the Lord. People from Persia, that's representing people from, you know, Iran or that area, Africa, just, just Europe, Gomer and Magog, just people from all over the world, okay, are going to be coming. It says in verse 8, After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been altogether waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time things shall come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now, stop and think about this. The Bible says here that Gog and Magog and all these other nations of Libya, Ethiopia, Persia, Gomer, Tagarma, all these different nations that are going to come against Israel, it says that they're going to think an evil thought in their mind. And you know what that evil thought's going to be? We're going to go up there and attack them because it's just unwalled villages. There are no bolts, no bars. No, we're going to just take them by storm because they're completely unprotected, completely unprepared for an attack. Now, let me ask you this. If this is something that's a current event, if this is something that's going to happen any day now, if this is something that happens at the beginning of the tribulation or something that happens around the time of the rapture, could it be said of Israel today that they're just unwalled? No bars, no locks, no gate. I mean, they're just a sitting duck. No way. But think about this. What if you're in the millennial reign of Christ and it's been peace for a thousand years? Look, if it's been peaceful for the last thousand years, you're sleeping with the door unlocked at night. You're, you know, you're not even going to worry about locking your front door probably in the millennium because things are going to be so calm and peaceful. And you could see how everybody's guns are, are rusting because they, you know, they don't even need them. The Bible says they're going to beat their swords into plowshares. They're going to beat their spears into pruning hooks. What that represents is taking weapons and using them for agriculture. It'd be like, what are we going to do with all these tanks? We don't need these tanks. There's no war. Then they, they could rig them up to do some kind of a plowing of a field or something. You know what I'm saying? Like they're going to take all the technology and think about how much money and technology goes into producing weapons right now. A lot, right? It's a whole industry the military industrial complex where they're just building missiles and tanks and airplanes and fighter jets and bombs and they're making all this equipment, right? Well, during the millennium, that industry is going to stop because there's a thousand years of peace. So all of that productivity of mankind, 
all of the brains that go into designing new weapons, you know what those are going to go toward? They're going to go toward designing ways to grow food more efficiently. And, 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 and so people are going to take all that energy that they put into building planes and tanks and missiles and bob, and they're going to be building tractors that are better and, and reapers that are better and planters and just high tech farming and, and, and all kinds of efficient ways. So it's going to be a time of great prosperity. You say, why would anyone want to rebel against that if it's so prosperous and all this great technology, abundance of good food and everybody's doing good? You know why? It's because Jesus Christ, though, is going to have some rules. On the, he's not, it's not just going to be anything goes. It's not going to be a free-for-all. And you know, there are people who just hate the Lord. They hate his rules. They don't want to live a righteous life. They want to do wickedly, and it's going to be a clean kingdom and they, they don't like cleanliness. They want to get involved in, in debauchery and wickedness. And that's not going to fly during the millennium. So it makes perfect sense that we read about Jerusalem being filled with unwalled villages. People are at rest. Verse 11, they dwell safely, dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. I mean, look, on a warm night, they'll probably just sleep outside on a warm night, right? They're not worried about somebody breaking in or anything because the, the crime is going to be so low and there hasn't been a war in so long. Nobody's been practicing with their guns. The guns are all rusted and, and not working because nobody cares because it's just, they're not learning war anymore. The Bible says, neither shall they learn war anymore during the millennium because it's just not a thing. So basically, when the devil goes out to deceive all these nations in the four quarters of the earth, he's going to put this evil thought into their mind. These people are sitting ducks. These people are totally unprotected. These people don't even remember how to fight. You know, these people are, are in an unwalled village, no bolt, no gate. You know, let's just go and just wipe them out and let's take over. We can win. We can do this. That's going to be the thought process. That makes perfect sense if it's after the millennium, like Revelation 20 said. But according to Tim LaHaye, Left Behind, TV Preachers, the, the, the prophecy books at the Christian bookstore, it makes zero sense. Because right now, you know, if you go to Israel, there's a giant wall there. Who's ever seen a picture of that wall that they have in, in Jerusalem? They have this big wall that separates them from Palestine, you know, and, and there's a giant wall, there's barbed wire, watchtowers, guys with machine guns. I mean, Israel is filled with checkpoints and soldiers and machine guns and gates and walls. I mean, it's not anything like what's being described here at all. So it says that they will uh, come upon them and, and they want to take their goods and, and steal from them and so forth. Then it says in verse number 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto God, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I've spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. That sounds like some kind of an earthquake, right? A shaking in the land of Israel so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. What does that mean? Every man's sword shall be against his brother. Well, a lot of times in the Old Testament, when there's a battle where the children of Israel are severely outnumbered, and these are times in the history of the children of Israel where they're doing right before the Lord. And when they're doing right before the Lord, he protects them. He takes care of them. 
And so when they're right in the sight of God and some giant enemy comes against them, whether it be the army of the Ethiopians at one point, whether it be the armies of the Philistines or whether it's the armies of the Amorites or the Hittites or whatever the heathen nation that comes against them that, to fight against them, what God would often do because in their own strength, they were just unable to win that battle. What the Lord would sometimes do is he would send a spirit of confusion into the camp of the enemy whether that was the Edomites or the Moabites or whatever the enemy, he would send a spirit of confusion where they would get confused and start slaughtering each other. Right? He would confound them and they would, now this happens in war. What's it called? Friendly fire, right? You know, when you accidentally kill a guy that's on your team. Well, what would happen is he would create a spirit of confusion where the Edomites, you know, might get mixed up and think that the Moabites are the enemy, when in reality, they're allied against Israel. He'd cause just confusion in the ranks where they just start just, you know, ah, you know, just start slaying whoever's around them. And they, they think that's the enemy because they get confused. So that's what God's going to do. Now, in Revelation chapter 20, we didn't get this detail, did we? In Revelation 20, he just said, you know, these armies came and they surrounded Jerusalem and they surrounded the camp of the saints. And then it just said, fire came down from God of heaven and devoured them. That was the only detail. Armies came, fire came down, destroyed them. Well, you know, don't you want to know a little more about that battle? I mean, that, that, that's kind of just too short of a, of, a, of a statement. Well, that's why he told us, hey, go back and look up Gog and Magog, get the details. Well, here's the detail. Before the fire comes down from heaven, he's going to cause confusion amongst all these nations that have come to fight, and he'll actually cause them to start warring against each other in confusion. So it says, I'll call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. They're going to get confused and start killing their own allies. And then it says, verse 22, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. So here's the fire coming down from God out of heaven. But here it's a little more detail that after he causes confusion in their ranks, he's going to rain upon them hailstones and fire and brimstone from heaven, right? So we know what hailstones are. They're obviously blocks of ice, right? Balls of ice. And they can do a lot of damage. You remember how the car dealerships, I don't know, do they ever have that here in Prescott Valley, the, the hail sale or no? I don't think the hail is even really a thing here, is it? It is, yeah, it is. They get hail here? Well, where I'm from in Sacramento, Every once in a while you get severe hail. And I know places like Texas, they, they get even more hail and bigger hail. Uh, but I know that in Sacramento, the car dealers would run a big promotional and they'd say, hail sale, we're gonna sell you hail damaged vehicles. So they have little dents so you can get a discount. You know, if you, if you don't really care that much how it looks, if there's a little bit of a dent or a ding on the hood, They'll, they'll sell it to you for a little bit cheaper, right? It still gets you from point A to point B. So if you're not too prideful and worried about the way it looks, you know, you could go get the hail damaged vehicles. Okay, but big hailstones, I mean, they can put giant dents in cars. Okay, and severe hail back in Exodus and also earlier in the book of Revelation, uh, it, it, it could kill an animal. It could even kill a person. I mean, if you just had this a giant block of ice dropped on your head, you know, let's say it's the size of a softball of just rock hard ice and that thing just slams you in the head. Or if you're just getting pummeled with baseballs of hail, I mean, that could really beat you up, right? That could really pelt you. So that's what's going on here. They're surrounding the city. They think they're going to go up and they, oh, these people don't know how to fight. They don't have weapons. They're not, they're defenseless. But then they get there. There's confusion. They start killing each other. And the next thing you know, God starts raining giant hailstones out of heaven. We don't know if they're the size of a, of a fist or a baseball. Or, I, I, what's the biggest hail you've ever heard of? I mean, I, I've heard of it being what? The size of a softball or softball size hail. I, I don't know the Guinness Book of World Record for largest hail. I, I would suspect it might even be bigger than that. But that comes down on them 
And then also fire and brimstone. Brimstone would be like a sulfur, like, a, like hellfire, basically. So hail and hellfire comes down on them. And he says, I'll be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I'm the Lord when he does that. Chapter 39, verse 1 says, Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And you say, you know, what does that mean? He'll leave the sixth part. Basically, he's saying only one sixth of them are going to stay behind and five sixths of them are going to go to this battle of their, of their troops and be wiped out when they attack Jerusalem. He says, I'll smite the bow out of thy left hand, verse three, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Let's jump down to verse six. I'll send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Now this is super easy to understand so far. Uh, people have made this complicated, but it, it, it's all making sense. It's all adding up. Here's the part where people get confused. This is the part that throws people for a loop. It says in verse 8, Behold, it is come, it is done, saith the Lord. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves with the sp and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years, so that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any of the forests. For they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall rob those that spoiled them, or they shall spoil those that spoiled them, and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. Aha! Right there, people will say, well, Pastor Anderson, you're wrong because this can't happen at the end of the millennium because they're going to be burning those weapons for seven years. So if they're going to burn the weapons for seven years, how can they do that after the millennium when we know that right after the millennium, you got the great white throne and you got the new heaven and the new earth. So where's the seven years then to burn these weapons? And if you look at the prophecy books, they'll all bring this up as like, well, that's how we know that this happens at the beginning of things. You know, not even though the Bible taught the opposite. They, 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 they in fact, in, in Tim LaHaye's book, Charting the End Times, he puts it in giant. He has like a giant text. The number one thing we should look at when trying to figure out where to put Gog and Magog in the prophetic timeline, the number one evidence is the, the seven years of burning the weapons. I mean, that's just, that's the number one thing. Okay. Now let's, let's just use our brains for a second here and stop and think about this. If this is happening at the beginning of the tribulation, as the televangelists will tell us, if this is happening around the time of the rapture, as the Left Behind movie would show us. Let me ask you this. Is that a time when you would want to be burning all your weapons when there's major warfare going on and major cataclysm and major upheaval on the earth for the next seven years? I mean, why would you just sit there and say, well, we don't need any firewood. We're just going to burn these wooden weapons. And, and, you know, we don't need any lighter fluid because, and we don't need any uh, oil for the lamps because we've got all this gasoline and we've got all this, you know, from these weapons and from these tanks and from these uh, wooden weapons. We'll just burn them. I mean, look, during the, during the tribulation, there's major war going on in the earth. You're not burning weapons. You're loading the weapons. You're cleaning your weapons. You're using them. That makes no sense. Makes zero sense. Not only that, but, you know, when God's pouring out his wrath on this earth and the whole place is on fire and God's burning up the trees and the green grass, you know, think about the looting that's going to be going on. Because the Bible specifically talks about that while God's pouring out his wrath, that the men on the earth didn't give God the glory who brought all these plagues on them. And it says that they did not repent of their murders. They did not repent of their fornications. They did not repent of their thefts. Okay, so think about that. So during God's pouring out his wrath with the seven trumpets and the seven vials, the Bible specifically brings up, hey, people are still fornicating during that time. 
They're still murdering during that time, and they're still committing theft. Now, think about it. when there's a natural disaster, don't the looters come out and start just throwing a brick through the window of Big Five Sporting Goods and walking out with all the jerseys and the Nike shoes and the Air Jordans and whatever, right? Don't they go in and throw a brick through um, Best Buy and walk in and they're coming out with DVD players and they're coming out with, with uh, all the technology, the, the flat screen TV. I mean, wasn't there just a disaster literally a couple months ago and looters were being busted with flat screen TVs down with this hurricane that just hit in the, 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 the southern eastern part of the United States and in the Caribbean. All kinds of looting. Can you imagine the looting when the whole place is on fire and all this cataclysm, power outages everywhere. I mean, the looters are gonna be going crazy. Murderers are gonna be going crazy. They're gonna be stealing and robbing and killing. I mean, it's gonna be rough. Oh, but we're just gonna be burning all our weapons. Just, we don't need these weapons. Boy, you're gonna need your weapons more than ever during that time. That makes no sense. Okay, here's what actually makes sense. How about after a thousand years of peace, right? Thousand year millennial reign of Christ, there's this one last battle, Gog and Magog, right? God just decisively wins the battle by raining fire and brimstone out of heaven. Battle's over. The enemy's been wiped out. Doesn't it make sense that at that point you'd say like, we, well, we don't need these weapons. We didn't even need them in this battle. I mean, God defeated our enemy. We didn't even need them. God wiped out the enemy. Let's use them for firewood. Let's melt them down and use them for other things. So that actually makes perfect sense. But the big sticking point for them is that they have this idea that immediately when the millennium ends, that just immediately you go to the great white throne and immediately you have the new heaven and the new earth. But that's not really what it says. Let's, let's, we'll close on this, Revelation 20. Let's go back to Revelation 20 and you'll see that there's really no evidence of that. So the ironic thing is that the Zionist pre-trib TV preacher crowd, they think that the burning the weapons for seven years is the big proof that it happens when they say it happens at the beginning of the tribulation, right around the time of the rapture, because they think that the rapture takes place before the tribulation. But ironically, this burning the weapons seven months is one of the biggest proofs why that would be ridiculous because why would you burn your weapons when you but you're going to need that weapon boy for the next seven years you're going to need all the weapons that you can get because of all the looting and all the the bad things that are going to be going on and and remember the second seal in revelation he's going to take peace from the earth they're going to kill each other you better have a weapon during that time so it makes no sense I'll show you the answer. It's pretty simple. It says in verse 9, they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne. Now let me ask you this. Does the Bible say immediately there was a great white throne? The same day there was a great white throne. Directly following, there's a straight way, anon. No, no, it doesn't say any of those things. Basically, God is not giving us a lot of detail. He's only hitting the highlights. That's what it, here's the proof he's only hitting the highlights. He summed up a thousand years in a couple of verses. Yeah, they lived in the reign of Christ a thousand years. He's only hitting the highlights here. He's just telling us, hey, here's a rough outline. You got a thousand year reign of Christ. You got Gog and Magog. And then you got the white throne, you got new heaven and new earth. He's hitting the highlights. You want the details, you got to go back to where? Ezekiel. And he gives us that clue by saying those three words, Gog and Magog. Oh, okay. Go back and read 37. We'll get some details about the millennium. Go back and read 38 and 39 of Ezekiel. Get some details about Gog and Magog. You see, the reality is that we do not go directly from the millennium to the great white throne and then directly to the new heaven and the new earth because of the fact that when the thousand years are expired, what does expired mean? It's over, right? And if, if, if we had some milk that expired 
it's not going to have a date on it that says November 10th, right? If I look at the date and it says November 10th, I'm going to say, hey, this is not expired. Now, what if it said November 6th? It's still not expired, right? Because today is only the 5th. You say, well, yeah, but I mean, it's the 5th. It says November 6th, so it's expired. No, it's not expired because if it says the 6th, it doesn't expire until the 6th, right? So when it's expired, that means the thousand years are over. They're over. It doesn't mean we're in year 998. We're not in year 999. It means a thousand years have come and gone. They've ended, they've expired, they're over, right? So when the thousand years are expired, Satan's loosed out of his prison and he shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Well, let me ask you this. Is that gonna take one day? Is that gonna take a month? No, 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 because first of all, he has to go around and deceive all the nations. That's gonna take some time. He's gotta put these evil thoughts into their head. Okay, but then secondly, they're gonna have to get the weapons together. Remember, all the swords have been beaten into plowshares, the spears into pruning hooks. So they're gonna have to come up with a battle plan. They're gonna have to get organized. They're gonna have to get their weapons together. They're gonna have to create so many weapons. I mean, they're creating a lot of weapons because remember, they're gonna be burning them for seven years as firewood. They're gonna keep finding weapons and burning them and reusing them for things, recycling. Okay, well, that's gonna take some time. So we have to understand that there's a time here that goes by. So after the millennium, that's when the devil starts deceiving people. If I had to guess, and, and obviously we have no way of knowing this, but I would just guess that for the devil to go around and deceive everybody and to organize this battle, if I were to throw a number out, I'd say it's probably gonna take like five years would be my guess. But you know, who, who knows? Maybe it's gonna take five months, but that seems too short. You know, maybe it could take 10 years. Maybe it could take three years. Maybe it could take two years. We don't really know. If you think about World War II, you know, the, the lead up to World War II, it didn't happen overnight. You know, it took about five or six years to build up to World War II. And then World War II broke out September 1st, 1939, but you had a build up for six years. World War I, you had a couple of decades of build up leading up to that. Wars break up, break out after a military buildup that takes place for a long time. Think about Saddam Hussein and the Gulf War. You know, Saddam Hussein is building up, building up to that, building up to that. And then he invades Kuwait, the war breaks out, right? But there's a buildup. So here's what's going to happen. There's going to be a thousand years of peace on earth. Satan comes out, he deceives the nations. That probably takes a few years. Battle of Gog and Magog happens. God rains fire from heaven and destroys them. But if you read carefully back in chapters 38 and 39, he also sends fire in some other places and devours some other enemies, the ones who stayed behind but had the same attitude or were part of the war machine. He sends fire in the aisles of them dwelling at ease as well. So he wipes them out. Then there's an aftermath of the Battle of Gog and Magog where they clean up the battle, they bury the dead bodies, they gather up the weapons, and then sometime shortly thereafter, you have the great white throne judgment, the final judgment. And then you have the new heaven and the new earth. And then you have, of course, just a perfect return to the Garden of Eden in the new heaven and the new earth where there's no sin. And there's no possibility for rebellion in the new heaven and the new earth because all of the unsaved, have been thrown into lake of fire at that point. Because at that great white throne judgment, I mean, all the unsaved are, are, are toast at that point. They're done. They're all thrown into lake of fire. So when you go into the millennium, you still have sinful people around. But when you go into the new heaven and new earth, it's perfect. There could never be another rebellion. It's, it's only the saved in their glorified bodies and in a perfect state. So it's pretty easy to, to, to see which of these two positions is right, you know, because all the evidence is pointing toward just the, the clear reading of just the obvious Revelation 20, Gog and Magog's after the millennium. The only trump card that the other side's gonna pull out is, what about burning those weapons for seven years? But when you actually comprehend that for a second, it actually ends up proving the post-trib pre-wrath non-Zionist point of view, it actually ends up proving that even more 
because it makes way more sense to burn weapons when you're at a time of total peace than when you're in the worst cataclysm that this world has ever seen. So what's the, what's the lesson that we can take away from this? You say, Pastor Anderson, you know, this is pretty deep stuff. You know, give me a practical application. You know, give me something that I can use this week. You know, well, here's the practical application. The practical application is that we need to read our Bibles and accept it for what it says and spend less time reading books about the Bible and spend more time reading the Bible itself. Lots of Christians today, they spend a ton of time reading books about the Bible, but they've never even read the Bible cover to cover. I remember one time I went to a boss at my work and uh, was chatting with him. This is back when I was a, a, a very young man and he was a Christian and he went to a non-denominational church in the area, but he was saved. And, and I was talking to him and, and um, he was one of the managers and, and we were having a good conversation about the things of God. And uh, we, we got on the subject of Bible reading. And I said to him, I said, well, I think that, you know, a, a good minimum, a good rule of thumb for reading your Bible is to read it through cover to cover one time every year. You know, every year, read your Bible cover to cover. You know, that's a good rule of thumb. That way, you know that you're, you're getting everything God has for you. And how long does that take? Really about 15 minutes a day. You know, if, if, you, if you're an average reader. If you're a slow reader, it might take you a little longer. If you're a quick reader, it might be faster than that. But it takes about 15 minutes a day to read through the Bible in a year. It's like three and a half chapters a day. Okay. So it's not a huge amount or anything like that. And I remember when I mentioned to this guy, I said, I think that's a good place to start. Is, is, uh, it's a good standard, you know, just to, to, to have as your goal of, I'm going to read the Bible at least one time per year. Here's what he said. Oh, there's no way I'm going to have time for that. Because he said, I'm reading the prayer of Jabez right now. And I'm reading this other book right now. And I'm going through my daily bread devotional right now. And if you look at the daily bread devotional, it's basically a page of man's word. And then there's usually one Bible verse. So it gives you one verse and then it's just kind of blah, 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 blah. So he's busy reading all that devotional. And then he's got his prayer of Jabez over here and he's got with a lion in a pit on a snowy day over here and he's got the left behind series over here so he's he's reading a lot of spiritual things that are making him feel like I'm learning the Bible I'm learning about God I'm learning about doctrine but he's missing the most important thing which is just picking up the Bible and reading it right so we need to make sure that we don't spend a bunch of time reading books about the Bible that we actually take that 15 minutes a day, you know, take that 20 minutes a day or however long it takes you and, and, and read your Bible. And if you read your Bible, you're never in a million years going to come up with this thing of, oh, well, Gog and Magog, that's right before the rapture. That wouldn't need, that, that evil thought would never enter your mind. It wouldn't make any sense. But when Tim LaHaye explains it, it makes sense the way he breaks it down. Why? Because he's going to take things out of context and get it all turned around. But if you actually just read your Bible, you'll never come up with crazy stuff like that. You, you'd actually just take it for what it said. I remember when I was a little kid, I, I, I read those three words, Gog and Magog. And I was like, oh, so that stuff in Ezekiel, that's when that happens. You know, I mean, it just kind of clicked with me because it's not really that complicated. But, you know, to people who don't read the Bible, you can pretty much get them to believe anything. So we don't want to be children. We don't want to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Let's make sure that we're reading our Bibles for ourselves, not just relying on the preacher to expound it to us on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, but rather that every day we carve out that 15 minutes and nobody's too busy to carve out that 15 minutes. And you say, well, you don't know my life, Pastor, because I really am that busy. I really don't even have that 15 minutes. Well, then here's what I'd say to you. If you don't have that 15 minutes, then take 15 minutes when you're driving and do it on audio Bible, right? I mean, pull up the, the there's, a, there's a great app that you can download, the, R, the KJV RVG it's called, and boom, you got your audio Bible right there. Do that while you're brushing your teeth. Do that while you're in the shower. 
Do that while you eat breakfast. Do that while you eat lunch. Do that while you drive. There is no excuse to not spend 15, 20 minutes in the Word of God every single day. See, I'm a bad reader. Listen to it. But you say, oh, I'll listen to preaching. No, no, no. I didn't say listen to preaching. I said listen to the Bible. And I'm all for listening to preaching but not as a substitute for reading the Bible, right? Because you, you need to have a time in your life where you just hear from God only with no commentary, nobody explaining it to you except the Holy Spirit. So carve out that 15 minutes. Carve out that 20 minutes and read your Bible. And don't skip Ezekiel, right? And say, oh, forget Ezekiel. Give me Psalms, right? Forget Jeremiah. Give me Proverbs. Forget Isaiah, give me first and second Timothy. And I, you know, you say, why do you bring that? Because that's how I used to read my Bible when I was a teenager, because I was too lazy to read the whole Bible. I would always just go to either Psalms, Proverbs, first and second Timothy, or I would go to the Gospels and just go straight to the red letters. You know, the red letter Bible, just straight for the red letters. Just give me something quick. I'd read about three or four verses and then go back to playing video games or riding my bike or swimming or what, you know, but you know, let's grow up and let's read the whole Bible. Don't skip Ezekiel. Don't skip Jeremiah. Don't skip Isaiah. Read that thing cover to cover. And the only way you'll ever read the Bible cover to cover is by having a plan and checking it off. You got to check it off. It's just, it, show me a marathon runner who doesn't have a training plan that sh and, and, and who doesn't log their miles. You're never going to run the amount that you need to run, you know? I mean, show me any business that doesn't have some kind of a plan, some kind of a, a schedule, right, of what they're going to do. Anything that you undertake in life, you got to have a plan, you know? So get that Bible reading plan, check it off. Otherwise, I guarantee you, if you just say, well, I'm going to freestyle and just read what I feel like, you're just going to keep ending up in Psalms, Proverbs, red letters, first and second Timothy. <laughs> you're going to read those over and over again. You're not going to get the whole picture. Okay. You know, make sure you have, and it's okay to read it out of order, read it in whatever order you want, but just have some kind of a plan where you're checking them off to make sure you plow through Ezekiel, you plow through Leviticus, etc. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and we thank you so much for all the wonderful things that you teach us and that no matter how old we get and no matter how many times we read the Bible or how many times we go to church, we can always learn new things because there's so much there for us, we'll never learn it all. And so thank you so much for giving us this wonderful treasure, the Word of God, and thank you for giving us a brain that would allow us to understand it, Lord, and the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And I just pray that every single person who's here this morning would read their Bible and grow in grace, yes, but also in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to grow in knowledge. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.